here we are. There's uh, over 80 of us joining together. Welcome. I want to um, remind everybody this is a monthly offering from Refuge Recovery World Services. This is not a Refuge Recovery peer-led meeting. Refuge Recovery World Services is the overarching nonprofit organization that supports uh, the peer-led meeting structure that we have, Refuge Recovery Meetings, also supports some teacher-led offerings. This is, is one of them, like this, and uh, like retreats. Like hopefully soon we'll have Refuge Recovery Retreats led by a teacher such as myself. Uh, and then at some point, World Services also has the intention to be able to offer professional treatments and detox services and help people in treatment. Um, so, you know, we have kind of three three pieces of our organization. Um, but I know some people come to this thinking they're going to a refuge meeting. It's not quite the same. Uh, like I've said in the past, if you go to a refuge meeting and people are doing what I'm doing, where they're like giving advice and answering questions, please let us know. Like that should not happen <laughs> at refuge recovery meetings. And I know it sometimes does, but it just shouldn't. Uh, it's not the structure. And it's part of what I'm going to talk about tonight is you know, this radical peer-led structure that, that we have created um, that doesn't have teachers involved in the meetings, doesn't have, that, that we're talking about and we're practicing Buddhism, which is traditionally a teacher-led tradition. And we're doing it without teachers for the most part. In the meetings, we're doing it without teachers. So, uh, and, and, and we, tonight's topic is, um, you know, thinking about teachers, Dharma teachers, Buddhist teachers, where does that fit in our recovery and our, our Buddhist recovery practice? Uh, mentors, going to talk about, you know, what does it mean to be a mentor? How do we relate to our mentors? How do we relate to the people that we mentor, our mentees? Um, and this, this peer-led structure of addicts helping other addicts, you know, that we're borrowing from the 12-step world, and they've been doing it for 85 years, and uh, here we are in our, you know, sixth year uh, of refuge recovery saying, like, yeah, we want to do this too. We want to do this Buddhist-based, peer-led um, meeting structure where we mentor each other, and we help each other, and we hold each other accountable, and we support each other, and I'm going to talk about that tonight. But before I get into that and um, share some of my own experience um, in recovery with teachers and, and studying and practicing Buddhism and Buddhist teachers and, uh, and mentors and, you know, and sponsors, you know, I'm going to maybe use the term mentor and sponsor uh, interchangeably. Uh, it's the same thing. When I created Refuge Recovery, uh, I just didn't want to use the same term that they use in the 12 steps. <laughs> I didn't want to say, yeah, it's my refuge sponsor and my 12 step sponsor. So I just said, what's it mean? It means to mentor. It means to, uh, you know, sponsor also for me always sounds like coming from like the like surf, skate, you know, uh, world like sponsor is like somebody that like you put their, your name on your surfboard. <laughs> Like, yeah, I'm sponsored. It's on my jersey. <laughs> it's like somebody who's giving you free, you know, stuff, paying you in some way. So I felt that mentor was a more appropriate term. So we're going to talk about mentoring um, and uh, what's it mean and what's it meant to mean. And uh, I'll have some conversation with you about it tonight. Before we get into it, let's meditate, you know, the core foundation of our recovery program is Buddhist meditation practice. It's the intervention that we are using is uh, mindfulness and positive emotion, uh, creating what we call heart practice, forgiveness, compassion, loving kindness. These, uh, the wisdom that comes from our mindfulness and our concentration practices, and then the wise response that comes from learning to be kind and forgiving is the way that we intervene between our addictive behaviors. Is the, it's, our, it's a huge part of our recovery. So let's meditate together. Find a way to be in your space. 
and I'll give some mindfulness instructions, but because we're talking about teachers and mentors and supportive relationships and, you know, service, I'll also ask you to reflect some in the meditation to actually contemplate and reflect on some of the important people that have mentored you so far in your life that have uh, supported you, taught you, inspired you, uh, as well as maybe reflecting on some of the ways that you've been able to use your experience to help others, the people that you've passed on some dharma, some support, some encouragement uh, to people you've mentored perhaps. So uh, let's sit for a few minutes, find a way to be that's upright and relaxed. And when you're ready, allowing your eyes to be closed. Relaxing any unnecessary tension our bodies may be holding. Softening the brow, the eyes, the jaw. Allowing the shoulders to fall away from the ears. Feel gravity. Gravity's effect in the body, pulling us into the chair, the cushion, the couch. Breathing in, feel the sensations that the breath creates at the nostrils. Breathing out, see if you can soften your heart, your belly. We begin with the first foundation of mindfulness, present time, non-judgmental awareness of the body, breathing, sitting, feeling this physical form that we inhabit. over and over returning to the body and the breath becomes an anchor experience, the breath always happening. The Buddha's initial mindfulness instructions were breathing in, one knows, I breathe in. Breathing out, one knows, and breathing out. How do you know the breath is coming and going? What sensations? rising and falling of the belly, expanding, contracting of the chest, the air entering and exiting the nostrils.
The first foundation is not just the breath, it's our whole body, head to toe. Sometimes we can scan our attention slowly from the top of our skull down through our head and face, scanning for sensation, mindfulness of sensation that's happening right now in the body, the face, the neck, shoulders. Down into the trunk of the body. And when you find tension, unnecessary holding, try to release into it, soften, breathing into the tension in the neck or shoulders, softening, letting go. Just enough resistance to stay upright, sitting up. The skeleton sits up, the body hangs loosely around the skeleton. And out into your arms and hands. Mindfulness of your fingers, fingertips. Back down into the trunk, the back, the belly, the pelvis, the buttocks, the genitals, thighs. The body, feeling the body rather than observing it from the mind, bring attention directly into the body. Down into the upper legs, knees, lower legs, all the way into our feet, head to toe. Mindfulness of this body that is the four elements. Where everything is experienced as impermanent, constantly changing every sensation every emotion, energy, pain arising and passing, pleasure arising and passing. And you can continue to feel the breath, but we don't have to make it the center. Just the first foundation as we open to all of the sense doors, hearing, mindfulness of sound. Both internal and external sound. Perhaps you can hear the sound of your own breath, your heart beating. And that very high pitched ringing in the ears. And the sense doors of smelling and tasting, present time awareness of smell, taste, sound, sight even with the eyes closed. What's your direct experience of consciousness of sight, of color, of shape, form? And 
And we open to the mind itself so often in early practice, we're so busy trying to ignore our minds. Come back to the breath, but the Buddha encouraged us to don't ignore the mind forever, become intimate, aware, awake to your own mind's habits, turn towards it with non-judgmental kind awareness intention to be forgiving and friendly towards your own mind habit. All of the craving of addiction arises both mentally and physically, but also all of the wisdom and compassion and forgiveness that will be our recovery, our healing, also arises in the mind as well as body. All of our minds, the human mind filled with both wisdom and ignorance. So we are training the mind to be more wise, less ignorant or confused. We can't train it by ignoring it. We have to pay attention to it, observing how thoughts arise and pass. How even the strongest craving or obsession is just a thought and a feeling. Just thoughts and feelings, sensations and emotions, hopes and fears, rising and passing through consciousness. Our practice of mindfulness is non judgmental and it helps us become non reactive. One of my favorite teachers says we become unentangled rather than being all tangled up, tied up in knots, identified with the cravings and aversions, hopes and fears. Mindfulness loosens the knots. We become unentangled in what the mind is doing or wanting or hating or fearing, we wake up to, these are just thoughts. Start to figure out, you don't have to suffer about what's happening in your own mind. Everything that we experience in this mind and body, 
sensations and emotions, constantly being perceived, the second foundation of mindfulness directs us to investigating what's pleasant, what's unpleasant, what's neutral. As you turn towards your own heart and mind with awareness, identifying that's a very pleasant fantasy or perhaps a very unpleasant fear. Some of the sensations in the body felt as pleasant. We enjoy them. Some of the sensations uncomfortable or painful. Ultimately, our task is to meet all of the unpleasant experiences in the body, the heart, the mind with compassion, which starts with tolerance and becomes mercy and eventually becomes compassion. Rather than running from our pain, we learn to tolerate it first to breathe into it, to soften around it. To know that it is impermanent. It won't last. We become less reactive, more accepting. Mindfulness teaches us, we learn to meet the impermanent pleasant thoughts and feelings, sensations and emotions with non-attached appreciation, learning to enjoy without clinging to the pleasant experiences in the body and the heart, the mind. And all of the experiences that we have that are neutral, neither pleasant nor unpleasant. We learned to also enjoy. Neutrality, being at ease in the absence of pain or pleasure. So of course it takes time and lots of practice, lots of effort, discipline to develop this wisdom that mindfulness is directing us to, the wisdom of compassion, the wisdom of non-attachment, the unentangling of our identification with our thoughts, feelings. Turning to see how impersonal so much of what the mind is doing truly is. So we keep practicing and we develop relationships with people who inspire us, support us. We allow ourselves to be mentored by people who are doing the practice.
we apprentice with people who have been doing it for a bit longer than us, have some experience. We become accountable to each other. So reflecting for a moment at the end of this meditation on some of the people who've been important to you, who've mentored you, who've inspired you. Sometimes it's not a person in your life, but a book. Teachings you receive from people you've maybe never even met. Some of the people on my list of teachers who I'd consider my teachers. I learned so much from them. I never met. I learned so much from their books, from their lectures, from their teachings. Reflecting on all of the people who you actually have had relationships with that have inspired you, supported you, even if at times that relationship has gone south and difficult, remembering when they were the right person at the right time, even if it didn't last. And then lastly, taking a moment to reflect on how you have paid it forward, passed it on, shared your experience with people coming in, asking for help, guidance, support. Maybe even just in a peer way, if you haven't mentored or just friends in the rooms, the kind words, the supportive calls, text messages, the ways that we are in community and sangha, encouraged to be kind, to be compassionate, supportive, even if sometimes that means holding someone accountable for some unskillful behavior. And then let go of the reflection and just come back to full soft belly mindfulness here now. Breathing into your own heart, mind with acceptance, with forgiveness, and with appreciation. Even if you don't feel particularly forgiving or accepting or appreciative, these are our intentions, that which we aspire to, these skills we are developing.
And when you're ready, you can allow your eyes to open, bring attention back to the room, to the Zoom room. I was, um, I'll share, I, I wanna answer any questions that people have about mentoring and have some dialogue with you, the Sangha about all of this, but I'll share a few things. Um, my experience, uh, 33 years into recovery, um, my experience with, with, uh, with all of this. Today I saw a post on uh, social media, on Instagram, uh, from an old friend named Jason, who I uh, put a post that he was celebrating 36 years of recovery today. And, um, and it just immediately brought me back to actually probably 36 years ago when he and I were both sent to these like drug diversion programs where we had gotten busted and we had to go do drug counseling and um and i remember he actually got sober it took me two more years <laughs> or three more years uh, after that he got sober in that you know initial thing and um and then kind of i kept getting sent to the 12 you know getting my court card signed and you know uh, but and then when i actually was ready in 1988 and went and kind of said, okay, I need help. I'm ready to do this. He was there and he reached out and said, you know, I, I, I know you and I remember you from, you know, three years ago when I was, when we were both getting in trouble and getting our, you know, drug court counseling things that we were going through. And, and he reached out and, you know, he's, he was never my sponsor, you know, but he, he wasn't directly my, but he's one of the people in my life that just like reached out their hand and said, you can do this, you know? Um, and, it, you know, my particular experience was, I was very young, I was 17 years old. He was only a couple of years older than me, but that also like, even though we're young, we're addicts and we can do this, we can recover and him being a model for me to um, see a, another young person uh, establishing and maintaining recovery, abstinence and, and recovery. So I was thinking about him and, uh, and the, the guys that came into the institution where I was when I was finally uh, kind of ready. And, um, and their names were Drew and Baron and uh, another guy, Chris, and they were coming in and doing service. And, you know, they were fairly new in recovery, but they were showing up every week to this juvenile hall and bringing in recovery meetings. And just thinking about like, you know, again, like those guys weren't my mentors, you know, on, on that formal, I didn't do, you know, but those were the, like, they carried the message. They were of service. They said, hey, you can, we can recover. And, you know, and became friends and later took me to meetings and uh, gave me that support. And so like thinking of all of those people uh, in our lives who show up for us, and it's the beautiful thing about this, uh, you know, peer led recovery scene, whether it's 12 step or refuge or whatever it is of like addicts helping each other, alcoholics helping each other, Al-Anon's helping each other, whatever the addiction is, food, sex, money, you know, <laughs> alcohol, drugs, whatever it is, that those of us that have had that experience can help each other in a way that people who haven't been where we've been uh, don't quite get it. <laughs> You know, how many times are people, you know, you go see a therapist and they're just like, yeah, you should stop drinking. Like, well, I fucking would if I could. <laughs> they don't get it. Um, the way that we do, right? The way that uh, people uh, who've been there can really uh, say I've been there, not theoretically, but directly. 
I um, I had a bunch, you know, over the last three decades. I've had a lot of different uh, mentors, lots. And I think that that is important, actually, that it's not like when you're asking someone for help, if you're new and you're thinking about getting a mentor or, or you've been around and you, you don't have to stick with that person. Like, you know, uh, uh, often those relationships are impermanent and people uh, change and people relapse. I don't know how many people have been through that so far in your recovery, um, but I've had lots of people who didn't stick around. Um, both people that I've mentored and people who've mentored me, who, you know, as we know, the recovery rates are unfortunately low. So there's, you know, there's some chance that the people that we reach out to for help aren't going to stick around. But they'll, they'll help us during that time. And that certainly was my experience. One of my, one of my most important early mentors uh, in recovery who was like the guru. He was like the recovery meditation in, you know, where I, where I was in Santa Cruz, he was like, he was the most spiritual fucker in town. And he helped me a lot and he didn't stay sober. And, you know, kept, you know, he had, he had decades then, uh, but then later, like, didn't stay sober, didn't stay in recovery but like helped me so much through at that time. Um, so I said in the beginning, I guess I want to talk a little bit about, I mostly want to talk about mentors, but I feel like there's this other question that I want to I try to address briefly. I don't know if I can address it brief, briefly, but what we're trying to do in refuge and in, in all mutual help recovery programs, peer-led recovery programs, where all of the 12-step programs, all of the, you know, uh, non-12-step like us, Buddhist-based, uh, trying to do this thing, spiritual transformation, psychological, uh, emotional kind of trauma healing that we're trying to do without professionals, without priests or dharma teachers or therapists it's a really radical fucking thing that we're doing of saying you can learn buddhism you can practice buddhism you can get freedom in buddhism without seeking out a, a teacher just by learning the teachings just by learning the uh, meditation practices, the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, you can establish and maintain abstinence, you can develop wise speech, wise livelihood, wise <laughs> actions, you will develop wisdom and compassion, and you actually don't even need the guidance of a teacher because you have the teachings and that that's all we actually really need are the teachings and how to apply them. Now, of course, I'm, we, I, we are totally ripping off the 12 steps in this way. And, you know, those guys that created the 12 steps 86 years ago did something really radical. They said, you don't have to go to church. You don't need a priest. You don't need a rabbi. You don't need a <laughs> imam. You don't, you don't need somebody to uh, you know, have a relationship with your higher power, you can have a direct relationship. And this was incredibly radical. Now in Buddhism, we're doing the same thing, you know, because I think that what they did was great. We can do this uh, together as addicts, as recovering addicts, as long as you have a methodology and people who've done it, we can then pass it on to each other. We don't need to go to the Buddhist temple. We don't need to go to the church. We, don't, we just need to get together in our, you know, church basements or in our Zoom rooms and meditate together and talk about craving and uh, the end of craving and the path, the eightfold path, and practice the meditative interventions and pass it on to each other. So all of that having been said, so I want to make this radical statement, which is you don't need a Buddhist teacher. 
that having been said, sometimes Buddhist teachers are really fucking cool and you can learn a ton from them and you know going to meditation retreats and going to teachings and having a weekly sangha that's not just your recovery group but like a teacher giving lectures you know there's some amazing teachers and i personally have benefited a ton from uh, studying with teachers who maybe don't know shit about addiction and actually might hit give us bad advice about addiction now so this is this is the rub when it comes to buddhist teachers because um a lot of them don't get us <laughs> and don't get the necessity of abstinence and might even give you some bullshit uh advice around like you can find some balance with it like uh, addict isn't your identity, you know, and I can't tell you how many addicts relapse behind getting too Buddhist and too spiritual and hanging out with the wrong Buddhists. And there's all of these Buddhists that like to drink. <laughs> and, you know, there's some of the most famous Buddhist teachers in the West have been practicing addicts and alcoholics and, you know, like, uh, or food addicts or sex addicts or, you know, in addiction while giving these amazing lectures. And so there's this tricky place where we have to use a lot of discernment. In my second book in the Against the Stream book, uh, I did a whole chapter that said, beware of teachers. Be careful, this whole warning of like, because you start practicing Buddhism, you think I need a teacher. But if you get involved in the wrong scene, it could be very dangerous. It could be, you know, it could really it'd be dangerous for your recovery. It could be very uh, harmful. So be careful around it and find that, use your discernment, use a healthy skepticism. I have a bias that, um, I believe that we addicts are better served by Dharma teachers who are actually practicing the fifth precept of Buddhism, which is abstinence from drugs and alcohol. Even if they're not addicts, you know, this is the Buddha's teaching. Abstinence from drugs and alcohol is the Buddha's teaching. And it's not practiced by a lot of Buddhists and it's not practiced by a lot of Dharma teachers in the West. So I encourage uh, open-mindedness and a healthy skepticism when it comes to teachers, including me. <laughs> I'll put myself on that list. Be, you know, uh, be skeptical and, um, you know, and watch, you know, if you can, watch how people actually show up. Watch how people actually, not just what we say, but actually how we live, how we show up, how we interact. So that it's not just there's a lot of people that can do a incredibly charismatic lecture. It's not enough. How do we walk the, the talk? So in refuge, we're doing this thing where we're saying, let's help each other. You know, maybe you'll come to a retreat with me or someone else. Um, maybe you'll have some teachers that inspire you. Beautiful. You don't have to have that. If you do have that, great. But what we're doing is saying, we're just gonna help each other. We're going to mentor each other through this process of recovering. We have the four true, we have the inventories, the mentor, you know, find somebody who's either done the inventories or who has um, at least is working on it. I think originally in the book I said, once you've been you know, doing this for about a year, then you could start mentoring other people. And then I realized early on, like, oh shit, I need to lower the bar. <laughs> I need to super lower the bar because you know we're a brand new recovery program. There's not that many people that have been doing this for a year. And even people that had decades were like, well, but I haven't done the inventories over here yet. So um, I can't mentor. And so there's been this sort of like, in some areas and in some meetings and some, there's been this lack of people willing to step forward and help each other. Now, I wanna say, you know, there's a mentorship pamphlet. If you have questions about this on the website, uh, you know, look at the mentorship pamphlet. We've recently edited it. 
Um, at one point it was saying, also from the book, uh, I think a mistake that I made in the book where it said, you know, for the first two months of your recovery, just come to meetings and connect with the community and, you know, established abstinence and then ask somebody to mentor you through the inventory process. And so then it became this thing where it's like, you're not allowed to get a mentor for the first two months. And that's not the spirit of, uh, of mentorship. Like, of course, like from the beginning, help each other. From the beginning, ask for help. Um, and on some level, I'm of the mind of the person with two days can help the person with one day. You know, because those first couple days are the fucking hardest. You know, by the time you're sober for two months, you're like a fucking old timer to the person who can't stop using, can't stop the addictive, you know, like how do you not do that for 24 hours? So the, the bar <laughs> is lowered to help each other, mentor each other. Now, I think that where we have it now is if you started to work on your inventories, establish abstinence from your substances or your behaviors that are addictive and you become addicted to, and then uh, start the inventory process. Make sure you're doing your meditation practice and then welcome the new people and help the new people. And as I'm sure most are well aware, um, one of the reason, one of the ways that these peer led recovery programs work is that the service that we do, the, 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 when we help others, you know, that guy Jason helping me 33 years ago, helped him stay sober, right? It wasn't so much that you know, he helped me stay sober too, but it helped him. And the service that we do for each other, the way that we mentor, we reach out, the text messages that we send, the phone calls that we make, the you know invitations, hey, you come into the meeting tonight, you're gonna go to this, you're gonna, all of that service helps us get out of our self-centeredness. I heard somebody um, not too long ago at a refuge meeting saying, oh, people keep asking me to mentor them, but I've only have a few months sober and I don't think I'm ready. Uh, or a few months in recovery, I don't think I'm ready. And I feel like that's a pretty, and I, I say that because I think that's a fairly common feeling. Um, my feeling, my opinion is, um, actually, if you don't start helping people, you know, you might not, you might, you might not stick around. That actually helping each other is a central part of our recovery. It is, you know, it's the um, uh, third factor of, the, of our path. Understanding, intention, community, communication, uh, you know, and then also I talked about livelihood and service. But, you know, community, being of service in the community, mentoring each other from the beginning, we have to do it. Like, I don't, I don't know how anybody's going to maintain long-term recovery without uh, reaching out and helping each other and allowing ourselves to be helped. You know, there's also that huge reminder of when you ask somebody for help and you feel like a burden, it's like, oh, I don't want to burden anybody with my problems that actually you're giving them an opportunity. Like, hey, I'm gonna let you help me and it's gonna help you stay sober, right? That's how this thing fucking works, <laughs> right? It's gonna help your recovery because you're gonna get the opportunity to be generous. You're gonna get the opportunity to listen to my shit and maybe teach me some healthy boundaries in the process and maybe teach me, you know, how to do this thing. So super important to, um, you know, we get a lot of requests of like, hey, how do I find a mentor? I'm not sure why it's not clear. Maybe I wasn't clear enough in the book or people new to recovery don't quite get that. You just have to ask. You just have to ask people. Um, you just have to go to lots of meetings and listen to people that sound like they're not too full of shit, sound like they're doing pretty good. 
and say, hey, can you help me? I'm new or I'm, you know, here and uh, I'm motivated and I'm, you know, I need some support around the meditation practice, around the inventories, around my recovery. Will you mentor me? And, you know, it's trickier now these days that we're not, there's not so many in-person meetings and we have to do it in the chat box. And, you know, some of the meetings have contact lists or mentorship announcements. Um, you know, it's the same seven people at most meetings that put their phone number in the box <laughs> and not everybody does it and you're like shit I didn't want that guy's phone number I wanted that guy's phone number and he didn't put it in the box or that woman or that person you know um, so we have to put some effort into it right it's actually uh, our job as somebody who's seeking help to ask for it say I'm here I need help will you mentor me whether you're brand new or you've been around for years, um, ask for help. And then it's all the rest of our jobs who've been here and are doing this thing to say yes within you know, uh, some healthy boundaries. I think each person has to decide what is a healthy number of people to mentor? How much can I give? Because you know, there is a such thing as too much, right? So maybe there's a number in your mind and it's three or it's five or it's 10. Or I remember when I moved to Los Angeles, I asked somebody to mentor me and he's like, I'm full up at 15. <laughs> you know, if, uh, you know if, if I have an opening or like, you know, I was like, fuck the dudes, like 15 is a lot. That's a lot of people to, you know, communicate with regularly. And so many people say, like, oh, I can do five or, you know, at a time. Now, when it comes to mentoring, and also this is some of this is in the mentorship pamphlet, people have different styles. And, um, you know, there's some people who feel like they are willing to be accountable and um, to talk every day to people that they're mentoring and say, you know, call me every day at 7 a.m. before work and, you know, I'll mentor you. Or to, uh, there's people who say, hey, I'm going to do a once a week, I'm going to do an hour a week you know, or a half hour a week, and here's your slot, Wednesdays at six, or, you know, Thursdays at five, or whatever it is, and um, so there's that style. There's, uh, you know, the style of mentor. Uh, my, my sense is that probably we mentor people the way we were mentored, I don't know if that's kind of generally, you know, you ask somebody to help you and then however they help you, then that's sort of how you pass it on to the people who end up asking you to help them. Um, some people might uh, say, you know, hey, here's your assignment. Like I have some people that I'm mentoring um, and my, my personal style, because I have a lot on my plates and usually I mentor people who have a bit more time um, is I say, here's your assignment. Do five of these inventory questions and contact me when you're done with those five, right? And, you know, I'm not gonna talk to you every day and I'm not gonna, you know, be your counselor or your teacher or anything else, but I will help you with this inventory process and I'll be accountable and, you know, if stuff's up, you can call me, but here's your assignment. Let me know when you're done with your assignment. So, um, you know, sometimes people will say, hey, we, you know, we'll want a mentor, but they're not really ready to do the inventories. They're not really even meditating every day. Or somebody recently asked me to uh, ask me, what should I do with all of my mentees who aren't staying sober? Who say, I want a mentor and I'm coming to meetings, but I'm not really ready to stop drinking or using or acting out in addictive behaviors. And at what point do we still try to help somebody that's in active uh, addiction? Uh, at what point do we say like, nope, you have to get sober first and then I'll help you. So these are all big questions and refuge is not gonna say like, hey, this is the right way for everyone to do it. I'm not willing to say this is the right way for everyone to do it. We have to find our own way and our own styles. Um, and, you know, we find out by, kind of trial and error. Find out what doesn't work by making some mistakes and having the humility to say, you know, actually that's too much. I can't talk to five people every day, too much. 
or too little, you know, like not smart mentoring people, uh, not being of enough service, being too self-centered and fear-based in our uh, life, not good either. So we have to each find our way with it. Okay, I think I'm spent as far as my reflections, but what are your questions? What is your experience? Uh, uh, does it make sense? Do you have a mentor? Are you mentoring people? And if the answer is no to either of those, why the fuck not? Get on it. You know, like, fine, you know, like, go help some people and ask somebody to help you. It's how it works. We pass it on to each other. It's what we're doing here. So if you like to dialogue, raise your hand in the little blue hand. I see something in the chat about um, resources for teens in recovery. I don't, you know, Zip Refuge doesn't have a, a young adults Sangha meeting that I know of, but it would be fucking great and we should. You know, that I was talking, I got sober at 17 and that guy, Jason, who has got 36 years, that group, I got sober in Santa Cruz, California in 1988. And there was a young adults meeting uh, last night. I, I'm in Maui right now. I had um, dinner with a friend who was part of, who's here. She's 33 years sober. We had this young adults Sangha. Uh, I mean, it was 12 step, but we had this young adults recovery um, group and there was a hundred people in that group and a lot of them, not, you know, maybe 20%, but a lot of them are still sober 30 something years later from teenagers. So like for sure we can, uh, you know, I don't have the uh, resource that you're actually looking for, um, Kristen, but we, you know, happy to support it being created and for sure refuge should have a young adult. Uh, group for for you know the people to feel part of that. Um, I don't see who was first. Joanne, please, you can unmute and jump in. Hello. So this is not on mentor topic. It's referring back to something you said early on about forgiveness. Is that all right? Sure. All right. So I come to find that I am codependent. My husband died two and a half years ago from alcoholism. And I, at the same time, made friends with another alcoholic. I was still drinking at the time. Um, and I have, within the last month or so, been slowly... Well, I stopped drinking about nine months ago and our relation, my relationship with this person has been slowly falling apart. She's an alcoholic and, and she's a mean drunk. And within the last week, it's really blown apart. Um, I, I see the relationship has, has fallen apart completely. I don't know how forgiveness comes into this. I, I, I suppose, I, I suppose forgiveness just comes into it as the fact that she's alcoholic and is not therefore responsible for her behavior. Is that about the size of it? Um, let me ask you a couple of questions, Joanne. Are you attending refuge meetings? I've been to two so far. Um, you'll find that um, somewhat regularly, it's encouraged in, in Refuge that we start the, re the forgiveness meditation practice right from the beginning and that we alternate the mindfulness practices like I did tonight with a forgiveness or, or compassion or loving kindness practice and that we alternate those in our daily meditation practice. And so 
And I ask that because uh, a lot of uh, when I say forgiveness is the internal feeling of, um, you know, the mind holding to the pain of the fractured relationship and just in your heart and mind saying, I forgive you as much as I can right now in meditation and developing that uh, kind of compassionate forgiveness inside your own heart and mind. Um, and then also asking for forgiveness, you know, usually in, in I, I tend to feel like it's always appropriate for us to ask for forgiveness, even when we haven't intentionally done anything wrong, usually in a friendship, especially when there's become fractured, um, you know, there's, we have some part and, you know, may have offended in, in one way or another, even especially someone uh, that's in active alcoholism. Uh, might be very offended by your encouragement to get sober. <laughs> so just a sort of like uh, asking for forgiveness and having that as part of, of what we do. Um, now you, last thing I will address quickly, you said, you know, is maybe because somebody was in active addiction, they're not active alcoholism, not responsible for their behavior. Now, I, I have to say that maybe this is the bad news for all of us uh, recovering people is that even we are still karmically responsible for all of the shit we did when we were in active addiction, <laughs> you know, right. like we still are fully responsible for our own actions. And it's part of why we then make amends and why we do the forgiveness and we purify our karma uh, later on. So you don't have to let someone off of the hook to forgive them. Uh, you're not forgiving them for, you know, she's still responsible for her actions, but you don't need to hold resentment, right? And you have the ability to free yourself from holding resentment. All right. I hope to see you at some more meetings. Thank you, I'll be around. Thanks, Joanne. Thank you. Uh, Tyler, you were next. Uh, thanks, Noah. Um, so this is actually about mentorship. Um, Kind of a question about, uh, well, let me back up a second. So I've got a mentee um, that has uh, been in and out of the Sangha a few times, you know, racks up three or four months of clean time and then falls off the wagon again. And, um, and this person has a, a really deep history of severe trauma. Um, so getting into the inventories and even just thinking about some of these questions uh, can be really overwhelming for them. Um, so the idea that I came up with for them was to just do a, like a mini inventory, say, don't worry about like the decades of childhood abuse and all that stuff right now. Just look back at the last six months and, and look at the, look at the, the suffering and the experiences you had, you know, in the last six months of sobriety until your relapse and look at what led to your relapse. And let's just start with like little bite-sized pieces there. Um, what do you, what are your thoughts on? taking this kind of bit by bit for people, especially if they're brand new to recovery or if they do have a really severe trauma history, mm -hmm. that's a kind of way of easing them into it rather than, um, you know, some of us dove right into the deep end and came out alive and others don't quite make it, so. Um, you know, I have, I'm of two minds about this. Uh, one is, uh, whatever works, right? Like if you gave that assignment and it helped the person, uh, great, you know? So I'm kind of, I'm, I'm a little bit, I'm not a super, you know, kind of rigid about, about our program. Um, and if, you know, if you found that sort of, you know, helped, then great. Uh, so I'm okay, you know, personally, I, I feel relaxed about like whatever, whatever works is my <laughs> attitude. Um, and then I also, you know, the other part of my mind is I think we have to be a little careful for playing, uh, you know, being too loose and fast with the assignments that we give and um, that there's something to just sticking with the script and just saying like, you know, you don't have to do this whole inventory right now, but you know, here's the, here's the solution that Refuge offers meditation, meetings, inventories, you know, uh, this, is, this is what Refuge offers. I'm here to support you. Are you meditating every day? Are you going to meetings every day? 
And are you ready to start looking at the underlying conditions, the suffering and the repetitive craving that led to you know, our addiction in the first place? And like I said before, the first couple months, you don't have to push the inventories, just push Sangha, push other forms of service, push uh, you know, practice. Because that's the shit that really works. The inventory uh, is very important. And I know it's intense and I know it's long. And, um, and it's intentional that it's intense and long because that's the stuff, that pain, unexplored, continuing to be suppressed is the stuff that people relapse about. Um, so I... Don't know that I gave you a great answer, Tyler, but uh, you know, like I said, like if you gave him that assignment and it helped, beautiful. And nothing wrong with also saying like, here's what refuge offers. Yeah, well, they're very familiar with the program. Um, yeah. So, you know, they know all about the benefits and, and they're back on a regular meditation schedule. Um, I guess I just wanted to give them something bite-sized to work with right now um, yeah. and leave all the heavy lifting and the trauma counseling to the professionals. Um, yeah. You know, cause I'm, I'm not in any position to, to offer any kind of help for that stuff. So, um, but like I said, just uh, a bite-sized approach. Yeah. I mean, that's important that like with the traumatic, painful experiences that are going to come up when, when we're listening to people's inventories, it is important to acknowledge that, you know, you're not in a therapeutic role. Your job is to just listen, just listen and relate. And that actually the uh, therapeutic experience, the cathartic experience is just them sharing that stuff. You don't need to tell them what to do with it or how to work with it or, you know, just, you know, you tell them what we do, which is like, okay, meet that with forgiveness as much as you can. Okay, meet that with compassion as much as you can. You know, like the tools that we have uh, in the Eightfold Path um, are the appropriate response to all of the traumas we've experienced. And, you know, are the, you know, compassion is the appropriate response and forgiveness is the appropriate response and mindfulness of how impermanent these thoughts and feelings and that their memories, you know, like it, it will change everything about the wounds that we come into recovery uh, holding and, and oh, you know, suppressing and avoiding. So, uh, you know, I, I like what you're saying, like not, not therapists and, you know, even if you are a therapist, not to your mentees, <laughs> right? Just a, a recovery person listening. All right, thanks for that. Yeah. Jose. Jose, did we lose you? Coming back? Yeah, I'm back. All right. I am back. I just wanted to say um, thank you. Thank you, man. Like, you know, sometimes the way I put it, uh, explain it to people is I am very grateful to the damage that crystal mess in my life because it brought me here. I would not have come here if it wasn't because it brought me to my knees. And you have changed the lives of some unnamable people. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Jose. Day. I can I can so uh, relate to that, and I don't know how many. You know, we don't tend to. It's not part of our tradition to introduce ourselves as addicts in meetings, but like in in the you know that phenomenon of like I'm a grateful addict. You know, I'm a grateful alcoholic. I'm a great and you know grateful because of just what you're saying, Jose. Of like because the way that my ass got kicked by addiction brought me into the Dharma brought me into learning about compassion and forgiveness and wisdom in a way that a lot of people that, you know, never get around to figuring out that we can forgive ourselves, never have the motivation that we have as addicts, you know? Um, so I totally get that. And, you know, you're in a uh, room full of people that it's, you know, at one point or another in our recovery, it just becomes that like, oh yeah, like, being an addict fucking sucks, but it got me to meditate. It got me to be of service. It got me to 
develop community with a whole bunch of really awesome people that I wouldn't have if I didn't have the desperation of addiction that drove me to this. And now I'm grateful. Easier to say once you have some distance from it <laughs> and you've gotten some relief. At the beginning, it doesn't feel like such a blessing. Sam, jump in. Hello, hello all. Um, I wanted to just uh, listen. This is my um, second time on listening to your live talks and I'm, I was so excited not to have to work tonight because it's so much nicer live. I don't know why. I mean, you're great on YouTube, but I bring it up, the YouTube piece, because when I was in recovery last year in treatment and the 12 step, I was really struggling um, with, with that concept. And it really, I, I was struggling a great deal with, I didn't, I didn't struggle with the fact that I needed to dry out and to get better. And to, I, I knew the trauma was my problem. I knew why I was trying to um, feel better. I knew, you know, that I needed that kind of therapy. And I was sort of promised that at that particular location and it was not um, provided. But I, I attended all the meetings and everything. I was, I was really um, determined to, to do something and every day. And uh, somebody came in with your book and she handed out photocopies of the first couple chapters and we all took turns reading as one does similar to the 12 step. And I was immediately, uh, it was like lit up. I was, it resonated with me so deeply and so profoundly that when you talk about the person who's had their second day of sobriety being able to help their first, that's what came to mind when you said that. Because the entire another 30 some odd days, there was no other um, available talks or no one else, but it, one man, one evening came in and handed out your book and talked a little bit about how much that had helped him. But that really was just one of the parts of his discussion. So I took it upon myself to go and find you um, every evening when they would do the 12 step, I chose to study with you on YouTube and learn to meditate properly. Uh, well, properly is not the right word there, but in a better way that was going to fit with what my needs were. And when I would get a little squirrely, it was easier to come back. And I have been thinking about the word forgiveness for many, many years, and I have been struggling with it. And this now allowed that little thing to unravel a little bit. And then the next place I was sent off to for a few more days, um, I didn't have that, didn't have access to. And they had of course said, yes, they do wrote, no, no, there was COVID and there were no meetings and nobody was interested in hearing me. So at 4 a.m. I would wake up and say, put your feet on the floor and go down to the rec room. And if nobody was in there, I would find one of your meditations and a little while later, someone else came in and said, what are you doing? And then another day, someone else came in, what are you doing? And two more people, and we had a tiny little faction of us, but that's, I think, something to akin, akin to what you're discussing. I yeah. didn't know anything about it. I couldn't tell them anything in terms of teaching. I said, this makes me feel better. And I follow the meditations and I have the book. And then we ordered it while I was in there. They ordered three dozen and handed them out. For me, knowing nothing about it and being a newbie, I feel as though that was my service to those other people who it wasn't available to unless somebody said, hey, hey, here's this thing that makes me feel really, really better. And I feel as though I can maybe stay sober, maybe forgive myself, maybe learn how to live a better and richer life. And um, that's really all I wanted to say. Yeah. Thank no, you. Lovely. And thanks for sharing that, Sam. And so glad that it was helpful and and what a great example like you're sharing of you know with just in treatment passing it on to the next person and the next person and and then that's how this works we pass it on and we say it's helping me a little bit try it if you want to <laughs> oh okay and then you know and then oh i've been doing it for years and it's helped me a lot and you can bring the new people through the process and it is a process you know refuge uh, isn't quite as easy as something like the 12 steps where it's like do one, then do two, do three, because we have this, uh, you know, wheel where it's like there's eight factors, right? It's like there's the 
two inventories. And so those are clear, but then there's mindfulness and concentration and livelihood and action and speech. And, you know, people are kind of like, well, what, what kind of assignments do I give um, there? But it's all in the book, right? And so you go through the book together and you discuss it and we apply it to our lives. Yeah. Anyways, thank you so much, Sam. I think uh, these will be the last, uh, last one. Liz, you can have the last word tonight. Hi. Um, okay, my name is Elena. Actually, I'm at Momenta Recovery, which is like a treatment center here in Colorado. And um, this is like my sixth inpatient treatment. And I've been in and out of NA for like over 10 years and just always like struggled to connect with it. And so when I heard of Refuge, we got the books ordered here and I actually loved it. Like I couldn't put it down and it was the first like recovery literature that I really connected with. Um, but uh, there's not a lot of Refuge recovery here at all in Colorado, let alone where we are specifically. Um, and so I got an AA sponsor and she and her sponsor both ordered the refuge book and like really love it as well. And they are, they've both been practicing, um, you know, meditation practices and stuff like that for years, um, outside of that. And they hadn't even heard of refuge, uh, but they want to do me a favor, I guess, and like figure out how to incorporate that into how they know how to sponsor, which is to take me to, through the steps, like traditionally. Um, and, but they also were interested in starting a refuge meeting where we are specifically. And I was wondering if like, there's a specific process to that, or if you have any like suggestions for working that into the 12 steps that they just don't really know. Um, well, first of all, just like, nice to meet you and awesome. And I'm glad that, uh, it resonates, you know, I, I think that so many of us have had that same experience of like, oh, finally, something that makes sense, right? Oh, there's suffering, there's a cause of suffering, there's, oh, there's, we can actually do something about this? Okay, great, and I don't have to believe in some sort of divine intervention, I can do this based on my own training of my mind, like, so, you're, you know, uh, almost everybody in refuge has that same feeling of like, whew, whew, cool, I don't have to believe that, you know, Santa Claus is going to get me sober. I can just, you know, <laughs> learn how to meditate. Um, 100%. <laughs> so for sure, start a meeting. You know, your, you know, sponsor and those folks for sure start a meeting. Um, for now, go to lots of Zoom meetings, you know, while you guys are in treatment, like Sam is saying, um, you know, there's Zoom meetings every day. Go, you know, get, get the treatment folks to let you do some, you know, log in and connect with community. There used to be a bunch of refuge meetings. Where in Colorado are you guys? Glenwood Springs. So it's like, it's technically the valley. I think the closest one is Grand Junction, mm -hmm. which is like two hours away or something. So, right. and yeah, so, I think more so like- sorry, right, right. Right now, there's no meetings anyways, like hardly any live meetings. Are there live 12-step meetings out there these days? Uh, yeah, some, kind okay. of. But, but is Depends there like, a registry that you have to like sign up on, or do you just kind of do like the AA thing and like two recovering addicts makes a refuge meeting? Yeah, no, to, make, to start a refuge meeting, there's some stuff on, on, on our website, refugerecovery.org, says how to start a meeting. There's a little, you know, it depends on if you want to do an in-person meeting or a Zoom meeting. Um, there is some suggested, you know, requirements and some things that you're agreeing to, um, you know, like only using the refuge recovery literature. So you can't really do a sort of 12 steps and refuge in, in the same meeting. They need to be separate. And I don't know exactly what to um, say about, you know, your, you know, kind of incorporating the 12 steps and, and Buddhism. There's been some interesting books. Actually, one of my mentors, a guy that, that um, you know, we're friends and, you know, in recovery friends, a guy named Kevin Griffin wrote a book called Buddhism and the 12 Steps. Uh, it's called One Breath at a Time. And so that that's a, one of the kind of, offerings of how to understand the 12 steps through a Buddhist lens. Uh, refuge doesn't really do that. We're just, you know, I, I'm just not interested in um, helping translate theism 
totally. in, into a non-theistic uh, worldview. So, uh, you know, we're just like, we're just, you know, we're just non-theistic. Here's one of the things, and it sounds like you don't even need this. And I'll, I'll end with this because it's just one of my favorite things. It doesn't sound like you need this for your sponsor or your treatment center. But for anybody in, you know, that's doing refuge and, um, and getting any shit from 12-step people, there's a quote from Dr. Bob, the co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, those two old white guys that started the whole fucking thing, where Dr. Bob said, um, the Buddha's four noble truths and eightfold path would be a sufficient replacement for the 12 steps. And it was like in a grapevine or one of those early pamphlets, you know, that the guy that started the whole thing said, you could just use Buddhism if you wanted. <laughs> so that can be really helpful when you're getting pushback from people who think the 12 step thing is the only way to go. It's like, well, the founder didn't think so. <laughs> awesome. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Welcome. Okay. I think that's enough for, let me see. There's something in the chat. Anyone needing to establish support? So Chelsea, I think you're, Chelsea, you know, lots of meetings every day, lots of refuge meetings and refuge meetings, you know, um, address all manifestations of addiction, whether it's drugs and alcohol or food or sex or people, whatever, whatever we're um, manifesting craving towards refuge addresses it and everybody meets together. And there is, some talk of uh, starting a, a food specific meeting or a um, uh, Al-Anon type thing, I think is going to happen soon. Um, so there is some of that is happening in Refuge. There's some women's meetings and, you know, so what we're calling, I guess, special interest or affinity groups that is happening. And, and I am in full support of whatever groups will support people in their recovery. And there is something about meeting with people who are suffering the same way we're suffering. So please come, come to lots of meetings. Let's see, last ones. Vanessa put up the online at Ref Refuge Recovery to inquire about starting meetings. There's a donation link up here if anybody, um, you know, I do this, I don't, I'm not getting paid for doing this. I'm, this is my service, but I, um, I'm happy to help do some fundraising for Refuge Recovery World Services, the nonprofit that supports this whole thing. So please uh, give some donations if you can. Thank you for attending. If you go to the donation page on the website, there's lots of different options of how to donate through Venmo, through PayPal, through, I don't know, all kinds of things. And... I think I'll leave it there. Um, offering merit, part of our practice, many goodness that has been developed through our practice and discussion of uh, the Buddha's Dharma be shared with all suffering addicts and all realms of existence. May each one of us have a full recovery and together may we create a positive change on this planet. Whatever the fuck full recovery means, I want it. All right. See you guys uh, next month. Bye. Thank you, Noah. Welcome. Bye. Thanks, Noah. Enjoy the rest of your vacation, bro. Thank, thank you. you thank you. Thank you, Noah. Thank you. Very interesting. I enjoyed it. Thanks, Judy. No, you're a badass motherfucker. Thank you for everything you do. <laughs> <Jose>. <laughs> Oh, thanks, Noah. Thanks, Kev. Good to see you. Yep, good to see you. We getting the beach meeting back soon or what? Uh, I hope so. Robin keeps checking, but they're being tight with the beach for some reason. So I saw you have against the stream open now. So I've been going in on Wednesdays to help Jason out. So oh, great. Great. Thanks okay. for doing that. Maybe I'll see you in there soon.
Yeah, and I, I'm, we can probably start some some meetings in there. Yeah, he was talking about it last night a little bit. So great. I'm game. So you guys have a good night. Bye, right, Kevin. Thanks for all the help, Richard. Appreciate you. Hey, guess what, Noah? 36 years today. Ah, happy birthday. 36. No fool like an April fool. <laughs> 85? Yeah, 85. Yeah, my buddy Jason, I was, you know, talking about that. I guess he, you guys share a... We share a birthday. Yep. Yeah. 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 Not, Jason, not Jason Murphy. It's a different Jason. But... Yeah, I figured that. 85. Yeah, I was already like in meetings and, uh, you know, sent to drug counseling and all that <laughs> shit. Yeah, I heard. Yeah. Good thing we're here now, alive here, and kicking. Here we are. Happy birthday, my friend. Nice to see you. Thank you. See you soon. Are you speaking? When's the birthday bomb? At the end of April. I'm, 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 the, I'm the guest speaker. Yeah. Great. I'll try to make it. Okay, good. I'll see you next week. Okay, bye. Have a great time. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody.